Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Okay, my final session in, uh, in Hong Kong. Just um, some practical teaching tips. Um, start off with a caveat. Um, I just want you to be clear that these are useful. I think they're useful. I hope you'll find them useful. They've been found useful for me uh, and may help sort of streamline or, or uh, improve teaching. But sometimes they may not suit you. They may be right for me, not right for you, or they might be right for you in some situations and not in others. So I urge you to be critical and selective in listening to them. Okay. Right. So to start up. I'm going to start off with some very basic um, uh, tips for beginner teachers, and it'll get more complicated as we go on. Tip number one, write out your lesson plan. Not just plan your lesson. Actually, write it out on a bit of paper or on your, on your cell phone or somewhere where you, can, where you can check it out, even if you never look at it. Um, just the fact that you have a written plan at your elbow, which you could refer to if you needed to, uh, does wonders for your uh, confidence and uh, it also is important for the students to know that you've, you've got something planned. Brief notes, what you're going to do, components, order, timing and so on. Tip two has to also do with, um, with uh, a lesson planning, include a reserve. When you're planning your lesson, include also something which you'll add if you find yourself with extra time or what you'll take out if you run over time. So these are all parts of the lesson plan, adding and uh, noting things which you might omit. Tip three, share the agenda. Um, I think it's quite important to say at the beginning of the class, this is this, this, and this is what we're going to do today. This is what we'll do if we have time, um, but this definitely is what we will start off with. Um, it's quite useful to write it up on the board and um, as, as an agenda, and even some, some of my colleagues actually tick off things as they finish them. So the students get a sense of progress, if you like, sense of structure, sense of confidence. It helps to structure your lesson. Tip four, don't give home assignments at the end of the lesson. There's, a, there's a, a tendency of teachers all over the world in all sorts of institutions to give the home assignment at the end. And the trouble with that is, is that the, the end of the lesson is the time when the students are at their lowest ebb of attention. Um, you may not have time to explain properly because you, you've left it too late and they're already packing up and starting to go elsewhere. They may not have time to write it down properly. They may not have time to ask questions. And finally, putting a home assignment at the end implies that the home assignment is the least important thing you're doing, which you don't want to imply because homework is so important for language teachers. Um, they, uh, for a lot of our students, a lot of my students anyway, you tell me if it's true for yours or not, um, the English lesson is the main place where they get English input. And if that's the only place to get English input, then they need to make it up elsewhere. And that's why you need your home assignments, to practice something, to reread something, to write something, to look at something on the internet, to use an app, whatever. So um, the idea is you give the a home assignment at the, in the middle of the lesson, or sometime when you have a, a natural gap and you have time to do it. And then just at the end of the lesson, a quick reminder. Remember, this is what I told you. Here it is written at the corner of the board. Um, remember to do it. The exception to that, of course, is if the home assignment is integrally linked to something you're doing at the, in the last part of the lesson anyway, in which case you've no choice but to put it at the end. But in general, try not to leave it till the end. <clears throat> if they've done homework, so they've done an exercise, or they've done comprehension questions, or they've... Uh, done something where uh, everybody has to bring answers to the lesson to check. Find ways to check without doing this ping pong, what's the answer to number one, what's the answer to number two, what's the answer to number three. I've seen teachers uh, in, my, um, uh, in my field, which is school teaching, 
waste half the lesson or more on going off, half the lesson being a 45 minute period, or more on checking homework and never actually or only getting to about half of what they plan to do in the lesson. So checking students through teacher-student ping pong interaction can take ages. There are other options. Um, just dictating if it's closed-ended and there's one right answer, just dictating the answers and the students self-check. Or give the answers on the board and students self-check. Or tell them to check in pairs and only ask you if there's a problem. Because if they know all the answers anywhere and they can easily check themselves um, and they, or tell each other, then there's very often no need for your input. If they do need, if there's something... Um, problematic, they do need help, then they call you over, but they don't do it necessarily for every single item. Tip six, allow wait time. This is when you have the teacher-student ping pong, when um, what's called IRF in the literature, initiation, response, feedback. Teacher initiates, asks a question. Students raise their hands if they know the answer. Response, one student is nominated to respond. The teacher gives feedback either, yes, that was right, or no, that was wrong, or correction, or, or comment, or whatever. IRF, it's the most common interaction pattern there is in um, lessons all around the world in almost any subject, not just English. Um, it's also, it, but it has all sorts of um, disadvantages. We'll talk about more of them later. Um, don't nominate the first student to raise their hand because some students think a bit slur and they, um, uh, and they will get the answer if you give them more time. And giving the, giving the, letting the first student who raises their hand give the answer tends to mean that you tell, ask, call on the same students all the time because they're always the same students who raise their hands first. Wait. This is a nice little tip. I'm waiting to see at least, whatever, five in this case, but you could say ten, you could say seven, you could say whatever you like. So people raise their hands before I'll get an answer, and I'm going to wait until more of them raise, raise their hands. We're getting quite quickly through the tips, but be warned, after we get to 30, I have some bonus tips after that, so <laughs> we're not, gonna, not going to end early just because we're going fast. Tip seven. Um, Useful, and many of you do this automatically, echo responses. I ask a question, a student gives an answer, I echo it. I've actually seen an article somewhere that teacher says you shouldn't echo, you should get the student to speak loudly and clearly so that you don't need to echo. But I think it's, it's really useful to repeat after the student what they've said for various reasons. Um, one is yes, to make sure everyone hears them. Everyone hears them and this includes, so you said you've, uh, the student says it and one student uh, may hear it partially or may think they've understood and not be sure but if you repeat it then it makes it clearer for them and they can be quite sure they understand. To confirm that they were right instead of saying yes you actually repeat it with a sort of positive expression on your face and they understand that it was right. For the sake of the repetition, just to give them extra opportunities to hear the input, to correct sometimes, but then you have to make very clear, we were discussing this earlier in, in, our, in our session, make it very clear that you are correcting, that it is a mistake and you're making the, the correction. Um, and a final reason is as an indirect compliment to the speaker. If a student says something and the teacher takes it up and repeats it, this is indirectly an affirmation, a compliment to the speaker. Your speech was worth my repeating and I'm saying it again um, myself. Excuse me. Yes. I want to ask, what if the students become too dependent on the teacher to don't listen to others' responses? What if the students become so <laughs> dependent that they need to, uh, that they start relying on people? To attention to other students' response. 
Yeah. Um, does this happen in your in your experience? Other yes, people? Yes. They just think the teachers will respond to the same answer. So why I'm going to listen to what others? I think that comes back to my never say never at the beginning. There are there are. Don't always do everything. I mean, all all my tips are not always do everything that I say. And um, I think, on the whole, it's a good idea to echo, not every single time for every single piece of input. Okay. And then, they're not quite sure if you're going to repeat or not. So, um, this is make questions open-ended as often as you can. Those arrows mean lots and lots and lots of answers, lots of different answers. So, for example, take a very simple um, Question, what is the opposite of create? What is the opposite of create? Destroy. Destroy. OK, that's the one right answer. OK? You said the answer. There's no further thing you can do with it. The teacher then has to ask the next question. However, if you say, how many things can you think of create and how many things can you think of that can be destroyed, you can create what? Give me some sentences. Come on. <laughs> You can create a work of art, you can create you can create an elaborate lie. Sorry? Job. Create job. Yep. Job positions. Okay. You can create jobs, yes, more. What can you what can be destroyed? Jobs can <laughs> all right. The environment can be destroyed. And what you're getting here, if you get um, as, as you saw from, from that little bit of interaction there, not only is a lot more practice using the target, whatever it is, create, destroy, but also a much more interesting interaction. So there's funny things coming. And, and humor and creativity and originality. So if you ask an open-ended question rather than a closed-ended question, on the whole, you'll get more language and more learning. Tip nine. Correct students yourself rather than asking them to correct each other. Never say never, but I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Um, there is evidence that most students prefer the teacher to the correct. I mean, I've actually researched this in a minor way myself. I asked uh, a set of teachers, uh, experienced teachers doing a, a master's course, to ask their students how they like to be corrected. And there were various questions like, do you like the teacher to give you the whole right answer? Do you like them to elicit? Do you like uh, the teacher to make you rewrite uh, a, an essay which has been corrected or not to make you rewrite? All sorts of questions like that. I'll tell you more about it if you're interested later. But one of the questions was, um, do you like to be corrected by your peers? And there was an overwhelming no. We want the teacher to correct us. And my students, the, the master's students, the teachers, said, oh, it's because the students um, will be distressed or thrown off by, by being corrected by each other. They, don't, they will feel uncomfortable. And I said, OK, go back and ask the students why, why they want the teacher to correct them. And they went back and asked. And it turned out that the main reason that the students wanted the teacher to correct them was not because they felt uncomfortable with each other, but because they relied on the teacher to give them the right answer, and they didn't rely on each other. And this was the predominant motive. There may also have been the thing about um, not, uh, not feeling comfortable, but the main reason was we want to know that we're getting the right correction, and therefore we prefer the teacher to do it. There are situations where, nevertheless, you will ask for them to give feedback to each other, as in peer editing and things like that. Um, sometimes the teacher just doesn't have time to get to everybody to do all the correction and they'll ask each other to help. So there's all sorts of exceptions to this one. But on the whole, given the option, if you can correct yourself, do correct yourself, it's more helpful to students. Um, please feel free to interrupt again whenever you like. Um, with protests or other <laughs> or other
possibilities or agreements or <laughs> whatever. Um, this I call uh, reverse error correction, correcting where there is no mistake. In other words, wow, you got that right, well done. That was a really, did you notice class that sentence, it's a really good sentence in English or a, a good use of this word or a good use of this phrase or, or a correct use in grammar. Let me draw attention to it, not only um, because um, the student then gets credit for doing something right, um, but also the other students notice correct forms. Um, so all these ways of drawing attention to correct successful responses. The trouble with this one is, and why, it's, why I think it's a very useful tip, is that naturally what we notice is the mistakes. We don't notice when they get it right. It's a, it's a problem of ours in a way, and we should be noticing. We should be noticing, we should be giving credit. And it, it also contributes to learning. Um, yes, this is something we discussed in the interactive session before. Um, it's not enough just to do a quick recast, just say the sentence again correctly. The student says, um, I, uh, I go shopping yesterday, and you say, I went shopping yesterday. Okay, that's not usually enough because students very often don't notice it or don't pay enough attention, and they don't uh, take the correction on board. We probably need to ask the student to repeat, elicit from them, indicate there's something wrong, ask them to self-correct, or explain, uh, actually give a metalinguistic um, um, correction, what the rule is, what the, what the name of the structure is, whatever. Okay. Um, this is a big dilemma. Again, it's something which we discussed a little bit in the last session. Do sometimes correct during fluent speech. There is a, a convention that when the students are speaking fluently, you shouldn't correct because it throws them off and so on. On the other hand, if you don't correct, they may well, as it were, um, confirm their own mistakes and, and, and fossilize the mistakes because they've made them. You haven't made a comment, so it must be right, so I'll carry on doing it. And it's a problem. What am I going to do? Am I going to let them get away with it with the danger that they'll um, uh, make the mistake permanent? Or am I going to correct them with the danger that I'm going to interrupt them, throw them off, discourage them, and so on? There's no one correct answer here. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that makes things easier. If the mistake is one which actually could lead to misunderstanding, it's much easier and, and more natural for me to, as you say, it comes into natural conversation, sorry, I didn't understand, could you say that again more clearly? The problem comes up when it's, when it's a mistake which does not interfere with understanding and 90% and of errors don't. They're just, um, you know, the things which worry us because we're fluent, competent, high-level speakers ourselves. And therefore, um, if we hear something which sounds wrong, it jars on us and we need to do something about it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily uh, produce lack of comprehension. I mean, the classic um, example for lower-level students anyway is the third person S in the present simple which beginners typically omit, which does not lead to misunderstanding, but which needs to be corrected. Um, it is often helpful to do so. Um, it really, ha I don't know how helpful this would be with Hong Kong students, but in a lot of places, it really helps if you say to the students, do you want me to interrupt you while you're giving your presentation, or would you rather I waited till the end? you tell me. Some of them will be able to tell you, some of them may not, but it's probably worth asking um, and getting the input from them. There is no right or wrong here. It depends on a multitude of considerations like 
um, how confident the student is, how likely it is that if you interrupt them, um, they will be discouraged or not, how serious the mistake was, and so on and so on. A hundred things that rush through our mind as we make these decisions, and we need to think about it on the spot and make a decision. But the, what the message I'm getting across here is do sometimes. In other words, there's no rule about never correct when they're fluently speaking or something. It's not true. There are sometimes places where you do need to correct and where the students will thank you for doing so. Um, there's some research on uh, students' attitudes to correction which indicates that given the choice, most students prefer to be corrected when they make the mistake, not later. So they'd rather you told them when they got it wrong that they're wrong rather than waiting and, and telling them later. Uh, at the beginning of a course, this is a series of tips about relationships with students, it's really useful, in my context anyway, you tell me whether it's useful in Hong Kong, to elicit expectations or requests from the beginning, specifically, what do you want or expect from this course? Um, any special requests, things that in your experience have helped you to learn in the past, which I would do well to take note of, or anything which teachers have done in past courses which has not helped you or even hindered you, which I need to avoid. How open would Hong Kong students be to doing something like this? Very? Or sometimes yes, sometimes no? That was not a rhetorical question. I that was. Okay, so you might ask for them to write you the answers, and then um, when, when you're eliciting things like this from students, you need to say, I think warn them that there's no way I can do exactly what you're asking me to do, because some of you will be asking me to do opposite things, and some things I won't be able to do for other reasons, but I will take into account what you're asking, and I need to know about it. So, yes, write me a letter, write me a few notes, send me an email, send me a WhatsApp. Um, just let me know um, from the beginning. Um, and um, link to this when we're talking about student um, relationships, sharing goals with students. I already said about this is what we're going to do in the lesson, sharing what we're going to do in the lesson. This is somewhat more wide-ranging. Um, you need to know from me, I've asked you what you want, you need to know from me these are my goals in our, in our course today for this semester, this term or next term. Uh, what are my, goal, my goals are? Um, what are the objectives of a particular activity? Again, something we discussed an hour ago. Um, I'm d going to ask you to sit in groups and talk about something. It's really, really important for you to stick to English because this is why we're doing it. These are my goals, these should be your goals as well. Um, and I'm making sure you know why you're doing it. I'm asking you to do a particular homework assignment um, and um, this is the reason why I'm asking you to do it. I want you to get practice in this, I want you to have exposure to that. This is why I'm doing it. I'm doing this activity, what I hope you'll learn from it is this, this and this. In other words, the students and I are, in a sense, collabor collaborating in their learning, and I want them to feel that I am sharing with them the goals, not that they're sort of being imposed on them from above. Get periodic feedback. Feedback from students um, on, the, um, on the course is typically given at the end of a course, right? which in a sense doesn't make sense because <laughs> if they're saying something really useful, I really need to know it before the end of the course. So if there's something I'm doing wrong, I, can, I have time to put it right. Or if something I'm doing right, I have time to, to do it more. Um, don't wait until the end of the course. Ask them to tell you, not am I a good teacher, but what in my course particularly helps them to learn or hasn't helped them, 
and do they have any particular suggestions? I do this regularly in my own courses and it, it, it's really, really helpful. Do you have any particular session suggestions for the next half of the term which will help me um, teach you better? Halfway through the 30, it gets more complicated as we go on. Ah, and this is, um, I forgot to, to put this up, um, sharing responsibility, not only what can I do to make the course better, what can you do to make the course better that you haven't been doing up to now, maybe you haven't been doing enough of. So we're sharing responsibility, it's not just me, it's you as well. Tip 16 is try to um, have interaction in the classroom which involves as many students as possible simultaneously. This is the big disadvantage of the IRF because each time you ask a question, ask for nomination, nominate one student, one student is active and the rest of them may or may not be active. What can we do to have more? Use as much as you can tasks that have all the students responding simultaneously or as many of them as possible including not necessarily group pair work, but group pair work is one option. Others, um, free response brainstorm. By free response, I mean I ask for um, how many things can you think of that you can create? And I don't ask students to raise their hands. I just say, shout out everything you can think of. Not sure how well this would work. It works well for me, how it would work in your situation, whether it would create chaos or whether it would be successful. But you need a well-disciplined class, usually an adult class to do this. Well, you, you're all teaching adults or young adults. Um, but the thing is that if they call out answers without waiting for you to nominate them, okay, you won't hear all of them because some of them are calling out together. You won't hear all, but they will, a lot more of them will be speaking and the students who are shy and wouldn't want to raise their hands to speak if they know that everyone else in the class is listening to them will very often call out an answer when it's under the shelter of the other students calling out an answer at the same time. So it's a useful technique. Just call out answers. Maybe I'll write them up as fast as I can on the board and maybe I won't. But, but, and I won't hear all of them, but I'll get a lot more participation. So that's one technique free response brainstorm. Another technique, responding not by an oral response, but by a quick written note. So true, I make true false um, a statements that write a tick or a cross on a piece of paper and then we check later. Or same thing, true false, respond by a signal. They all do this or this whether it's right or wrong, but everybody is responding, not just the person who raised their hand and said true. Mingling is getting up, finding a partner, exchanging information with that partner, breaking off, finding a partner, exchanging information, and so on. Um, all sorts of different uh, tasks you can give here. For example, um, I have, uh, each student has a new word they've learned from the internet or from a recent and they go around checking it with each other if, if other students know the word I've chosen or teaching it if they don't. Um, writing on the board, do you have students come up to write on the board? Yes. It's a waste of time just to have one student writing on the board, you've got big boards here. You can have three or four students writing at the same time, more students activated. And then as soon as one student finishes, they hand the marker to another student, another student comes up, and you get more participation. So these are all tips to help participation. Pair or group work, I already mentioned. Tip 17, teacher talk. Teacher talk gets a very bad press. Um, there are actually, uh, I've seen... Um, lesson assessment forms by teacher trainers which have, um, you know, te uses a lot of teacher talk as a negative thing. And if, if you use a lot of teacher talk, you get marked down. And I think teacher talk is a really good thing. It's really useful. It's, it's, it's 
Um, for many students, it's the major form of comprehensible input, oral input that they're going to get. Um, and um, it's also, a teacher's job is to teach, and teaching is telling. I think it's perfectly legitimate to tell things. This is what we're here for. A student doesn't know something. The teacher's job is to tell them, not to elicit from them all the time, activate them. I know, you don't know, I'll tell you. Simple thing. It doesn't mean to say you shouldn't activate students. Of course you should activate students. But this doesn't mean holding back when you have something you could tell them, you could um, reveal to them, you could make accessible to them, and you don't do it just because you think teacher talk is bad. Teacher talk is good. Lowering teaching, teacher talk time, TTT, is not a value in itself. Um, group work is not necessarily a good thing. Again, I don't know whether this is true in Hong Kong, but worldwide there is a sort of general feeling that we ought to be doing group work. Group work is a good thing. Group work is not a good thing. Group work is useful for particular goals. And for other goals it can be really bad. It's like, like any other tool, a pencil, a paper, a computer. It's good for some things and not good for others. Good, for example, for oral uh, interaction. If you have a group of 20 students and you have a full class discussion for, twin, for 10 minutes, so each student maybe will speak for half a minute, maybe, a lot of them won't speak at all. If you put them into five groups, you'll, five groups of four, you'll get five times as much talk. And if you put them into ten groups, you'll get ten times, ten, ten pairs, you'll get ten times as much talk. And even if some of the time they're lapsing into mother tongue, you'll still get more talk in English than you would have done through full class interaction. So that's a place where group work, I think, is really important. But, and it's good as a change for teachers, or individual work, um, but group work may result in much slower process. They're finding out things in groups which you could help them find out in a fraction of the time by teacher fronted. It may result in some students doing nothing and leaving it to one or two students in the group to do all the work. may result in sharing of ignorance rather than sharing of knowledge. Sounds funny, but it happens. May result in students going off task and doing something completely different. So this is my bottom line. Okay, If you're going to use group work, use it because it achieves better learning, not just because it's group work and we ought to be doing it. Can I pause for a moment? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you'll touch on it later. Uh, group writing, have you tried it? Do you think that group writing also kind of applies? Group writing. Um, I think actual composition, I'm not happy about it because writing is normally a solitary activity. And you ask students to write together, you'll usually find that one is doing all the work. However, preparing for writing, brainstorming together, thinking together of ideas is really useful. Follow up on writing, let's look at each other's texts and see if we can help each other make them better is useful as well. So I'd say actual composition, I would let them do on their own, but the before and after, there's a place for collaboration. Anything else? While I'm pausing? 19. <laughs> This was a, a trap I fell into at the beginning of my teaching again and again, until quite late on. You know, I'm really keen to get them going. So I say, get into your groups, and I'll tell you what you do. And of course, if you put them into groups first and then give them the instructions, half of them have their backs to you and they're talking to each other and not really focusing. So read instructions before operating. Tell them what you want them to do before you tell them to go into groups. When you're sure they know what they have to do, then put them into groups. And I keep falling into this trap, even to the present day. It, it happened to me last year. <laughs> Tip 20. 
I'm going to take a little bit of time over this. It's something we, which came up in one of the um, this week. I don't remember which one. Critical thinking. Um, encouraging them not to accept what they're told unthinkingly, but checking out, detecting these sorts of things. Doing exercises with them which actually encourage them, even at a not very, very high level, to think critically and not just accept at face value everything they're told. Here's some examples, just for fun. Inherent contradiction. Can you detect the contradiction in these? I mean, you come across expressions like this, and when you think about it, it's, it doesn't make sense. You come across this. You come across this. Let's think for a moment what objective means and what opinion means. Yeah, that's just from a, from a taken out of an advertisement. Um, tautology, saying the same thing twice, and this keeps coming up in my students, compositions, and I keep putting them up about it, but it's quite worth doing as uh, a separate exercise. What's wrong with these? Absolutely. It, it's a cliche, um, which, which is used um, a lot. But nevertheless, I think it's really useful to say, OK, people say this, but think about it a moment. Does it make sense? So even if, if it's, it's passed into the language, yeah. nevertheless, I think it's valuable to tell the students, even something which is said by a lot of people, just think about what it means. Yes, they're going to see it. OK, and they may carry on using it, but I just want them to be aware of underlying meanings and what's going on here. Or things like uh, he, computes, he commutes back and forth from Hong Kong Island every day. What is commuting? And these meet together. How could you meet not together? No. Um, Again, this is also something you're going to come across, basic and fundamental. But if it's basic, then obviously it's fundamental. You don't need to. Um, underlying assumptions. What assumptions? This is quite difficult. What assumptions underlie these statements? Anyone? Choose any one and tell me what, what assumption is, is underlying it, never mind which. Yes? Number one, some poisons are naturally dangerous. There's a lot of natural things which are not good for you. But there's this sort of underlying idea that natural equals good, and it doesn't. Number three is a bandwagon mentality. Bandwagon mentality, exactly. Sheep in a flock. Number two is the, the word scientifically, but no evidence actually brought. Okay, it's like research shows that. You've heard your students write research shows that and then fail to give any reference at all. You've got to give, a, you've got to give some kind of uh, thing, you've got to back up your statements. The same one for number five. Yeah. Number five is the sheep mentality. Yeah, the, the herd. Everyone knows that is not evidence. And it's not even true. Um, this one, old is bad, which I personally take offence at. <laughs> um, premise and conclusion: What's the, what's wrong with these? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because the two things go together doesn't mean to say that one thing causes the other. <laughs> I hope it's true. <laughs> um, 
the um, etymology fallacy. So because a word originally meant something, therefore that's what it means today. It's not true. Um, we'll come back to this in a moment. But this one comes up in a lot of research. Correlation does not mean causality. Uh, it's the same with uh, number one, actually. She spends a lot of reading, so she reads very well. It could be the other way around. She reads very well, so she spends a lot of reading. Or, or it's a recursive um, process where one supports the other, but not necessarily one leads to the other. Um, this one? Well, exactly. Um, the, the problem with lying implies a deliberate attempt to deceive. Some, the fact that someone says an untruth is not necessarily a lie. And it's a question of understanding the meaning of the word lie and the underlying connotation. Um, okay, just some fun exercises, which I think are useful to do for uh, critical thinking to get students to think twice and then apply them when they're reading academic articles, because a lot of these come up in academic prose. Tip 21, don't ask students to use dictionaries in class to find a new word in class. Again, in general, but not, not always. Um, firstly, because it's time consuming, you can tell them the, what the word means in a fraction of the time it takes them to look it up in a dictionary, even if it's electronic. The dictionary expression may not be clear, and they may choose the wrong meaning. And this goes even if they're looking up in mother tongue on their telephones. Uh, they may choose the wrong answer. And dictionary tasks on the whole should be home assignments rather than class ones because of the time factor. If you are there available to teach them, use yourself, get them to use you. Dictionary is for when the teacher is not available. Reading strategies, um, and this comes really from um, my annoyance with what's going on in my home um, context of Israel, where in EAP, teachers spend an inordinate amount of time teaching reading strategies like look for the subtitle, look for the the dates and the, 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 the proper names, look for, skim, scan for particular information, look at the heading. Okay, look at the heading <coughs> is useful, but it's not a substitute for knowing what the heading means. It's no use finding a heading and then not knowing what it means. How does that help you? The strategy doesn't help you. What helps you, if you is the English, if you know the words. Reading strategy tips like skimming, scanning, looking for particular information are useful to advanced learners, but they are not a substitute They make reading faster. They are not a substitute for knowing the language or knowing the words, and they're pretty useless at intermediate levels. Very genres, again, comes from my experience with EAP in Israel, where the only texts students are ever asked to read are academic research articles. Um, I think they should be today looking at a range of genres, what kinds of things may they need in their studies, in their future careers, what will they need to be able to cope with. Um, in interaction with other students or teachers in order to progress in their learning, in order to clarify or discover needed information and so on. Um, for example, yes, academic articles relevant to the subject, but they also might need to look up to be able to read and understand explanations of concepts, of terms, of processes. They may need to understand reports, commentary, um, critical reviews, email correspondence, they meet, need to understand a manual of directions for something, encyclopedia entries. Those are relatively long sections of prose. But they also may, may need to understand English 
as it appears in information display, which is more and more common these days, things like infographics on the internet, data display of various kinds, graphs, charts, flowcharts, lists. They may need to be able to look at syllabuses. I'm talking about all sorts of um, uh, information which is presented not as consecutive prose, but in chunks or a hyperlinked small text, syllabuses, itineraries, bibliographies, conference programs, calls for papers. All these are important types of text that they need to understand, which are not consecutive paragraphs or prose. Um, and finally, and this is, I'm not sure this is so important, but it's useful, particularly if you've got a sort of 10 minutes left at your, your lesson, you want to give them something interesting to read. Quotations, proverbs, short emails, slogans, cliches, newspaper headings, street signs, what's called um, the linguistic uh, landscape. Lots of that in Hong Kong. There are some countries, of course, where it's almost non-existent in English. Uh, dictionary entries. Yeah? I move on. Um, tip 24, devote class time to vocabulary teaching. It's worth it. Vocabulary is the key to proficiency and incidental encounter is not enough, so you need to um, identify new items in text, give them deliberate teaching of a new word or a new phrase in class, new words you've learned recently. Dictations, you know, these old conventional um, techniques still have use in EAP. Um, the use of vocabulary notebooks. Prefixes and suffixes are useful, but only at an advanced level. At an earlier level, they probably are not very useful to teach for your intermediate and pre-intermediate students. Most prefixes and suffixes don't help very much to access meaning. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit skeptical about what's called morphological awareness. It's got limited um, value. Um, for example, dis meaning not, but in the most common words with dis, it doesn't actually mean not at all, or not obviously. It, the noting, knowing what dis means would not help you understand any of these words. At a higher level, it starts being useful. Okay, the less frequent words. But even there, there are ones where it doesn't help. Sub meaning under, again. The intermediate level words, sub doesn't help you at all because it's nothing to do with under. At a higher level, it starts being useful. So teach um, prefixes and suffixes, particularly prefixes, um, at a higher level, not at a lower level. 26. Don't ask students to guess meanings of new words from context. <laughs> I've talked about this in another, um, in another session, and I also brought evidence which shows that it's, it's not effective. Most cases, words cannot be guessed from context. I won't make you do this. In another session, we've actually done it and, and experienced how difficult it is to guess. Just explain. Ask them to guess only if you're sure that the text is what's called pregnant. In other words, the text does give away the meaning. In most cases, it doesn't. Occasionally it does, and then it's a good idea to ask them to infer. Use L1 occasionally. L1 use can help to save time explaining a new, new vocabulary item. This is a very quick mother tongue equivalent which you know. Not all of you know, but if you know it, um, then you explain it in a single second, and then, um, and then you have more time for practicing the word in an English context. To clarify interference-based errors, you're making this mistake because this is what it is in Cantonese. That's why you're making the mistake. Understanding why they're making the mistake can help them avoid it. Um, and raising awareness through translation, which is you may or may not uh, find useful. Tip 28, 
teach multi-word items, not just single words. Apparently about one-tenth of vocabulary items are in fact composed of more than one word, which could not be guessed from the single words that compose it. For example, an expression like by and large, you may not know what by means and and means and large means, that doesn't help you understand what the expression by and large means, that it happens to mean in general, which has got nothing to do with any of the component words. Um, Okay, here are some more examples. They need to learn vocabulary, which is combinations of words, not just <coughs> single words. At cross purposes, difficult to explain, but it's not understandable if you know cross and purposes and so on. True of all of these. Tip 29, deepen as well as broaden vocabulary knowledge in all these ways. And I went into this quite a lot in another session this week. I'm not going to go so deeply now. Um, use as another part of speech. Look at other meanings of the word. Look at phrases which use the word. Look at the connotations of a word. Does it have positive, negative connotations? Look at, is it appropriate for formal or informal register? Is it appropriate for particular genre and not for other genres? Um, word families, expanding use of word families. Prefixes and suffixes, as I said, at a high level. Um, look at, looking at synonyms and opposites of words, associated items, etymology of items. Some of those can be interesting. I haven't got time to go into these now. I'm just suggesting that um, when we, it's not necessarily a matter of teaching new words, but very often teaching, taking a word they already know and thinking about what are the synonyms, what are the phrases that go with it. Um, uh, one really nice activity for this is to ask them to take a word they already know, look it up in a dictionary. We usually look up words in dictionaries we didn't know. We tell them to look up something they did know and find out what other meanings it has. What other parts of speech could it be? What phrases or expressions is it part of? And so on. Some possibly even the etymology. And the tasks. I won't um, go into these, uh, but I will. These are all tasks which have to do with the different um, kinds of deepening of vocabulary knowledge, looking at differences between synonyms. Um, last tip, except I've got some bonuses if you want them, but we'll start with, we'll, tip 30 is do your own thing. Identify your strengths and build on them. Much more important than looking for what your weakness is and trying to correct them. I may not be able to do something which my colleague does really, really well. I'm not going to punish myself because I can't do it. I'm going to look at things which I know how to do well and try and do them even better. So this is tip 30. Please take note. Teach the way you like to teach. And try not to compare yourselves with successful colleagues. Do you want bonus tips? Or do you want to stop and discuss? Take a vote here. Discussion? Bonus tips? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll have time for both because we don't actually have to vacate the premises until 6.30, so maybe we'll have time. Okay. Seven bonus tips. All right. This is a useful tip for mixed ability classes. Um, limit tasks by time rather than amount. In other words, um, Spend one hour reading. Do as many of you can, as you can of these exercises in 40 minutes. Instead of saying, do exercises B, C, and D, you say, here are exercises B, C, and D. Take 40 minutes and do as much of them as you can. Now, you might not be able to trust the students to do that. This is, this is a, a major problem. But if you can trust them to do it like that, or if you use it in class where obviously you, you can supervise the amount of time they're taking, take 10 minutes and do as much as you can, 
then what this means is that the faster students can do more and the slower students can do less without feeling that you know, they're going too fast or too slow. Each person works according to their own level. And it's a really helpful tip for mixed level classes. <coughs> Limit by time, not amount. This is for cl in class, OK? And the same sort of thing also for the same goal. Give everyone the same relatively simple task. Everyone has to do this, exercise one, or writing task one, or questionnaire one. And if you wish, if you want the extra challenge, if you have the extra time for whatever reason, here is an optional task to add. OK, some students are lazy, will just say, oh, OK, I'll go for the minimum. On the whole, my experience with trying this is, is the, the opposite problem, that the less able students try to do things which actually they're not able to do and, and, and find it difficult. But it's, but it's a good strategy to help with mixed ability classes, mixed level classes. Tip 33, speaking. And this is something which is the basis of the first book I ever wrote, Discussions That Work. Uh, base speaking activities on tasks, not topics. So a topic-based discussion is students talk about X. Okay. Task-based is do this. Find as many um, answers to this question as you possibly can. Share with each other. Find as many things as you possibly can which you have in common. Um, typically, the task-based discussion activity does not include the word talk at all. It simply includes the word find, decide, um, rate, um, choose. And it's a task, it is a task, however, which they cannot do without talking. So it's, it's uh, examples. Um, decide on order of priorities of a set of qualities. You give a whole lot of qualities of a good parent or teacher or student and ask the group to decide which is the most important quality, which is the second most, which is the third most. But they have to come to a consensus. Brainstorm as many solutions to a given dilemma as possible, then decide which is best. Decide on a set of reforms you would bring in to improve your institution, and then share. This is a, a creativity uh, activity. Try to think as many uses as you can for an object, a pen, tin can, sheet of paper. Plan an event. Um, find as many things as you can that you have in common with your partner. Um, all these things are tasks. Again, it's decide, try, plan, find, no talk, but they cannot do it except by talking. And on the whole, at the high level of students who you're, most of you are teaching, task-based um, discussions work much better than do topic-based ones. Tip 34. For listening exercise, those of you who do listening in your classes, it's better to use video than audio. Partly because it's more natural. In most situations, we see the person who is speaking, not all, telephone or loudspeaker announcements or radio, but on the whole, most 90% of our listening is done to people we can actually see. And therefore, it makes sense to use video rather than audio. And all these things help you to understand. 35. <laughs> It's very fashionable recently to ask students to go to corpus concordances to check out uh, usages, find out from the corpus which is more common, data as singular or data as plural. Takes hours. Interesting, could be done once as a fun exercise, but very time consuming. Much easier just to tell students, well, data is usually plural. Can be singular is usually plural. Yeah. Do 
Okay. You're not around, sure. But not in the class. And um, uh, if, and if, of course, they come up with the problem on their own, if they come up with the problem in class, then you can tell them the answer. If they come up with the problem at home, they can use uh, this, or they can, in many cases, just looking out of a dictionary will give them the answer. Okay, this is my reason. Get students to rewrite again. This is something we discussed earlier. Um, rewriting a composition after feedback is a very learning-rich process. Not, this is not actually a tip I need to give you because it's very common in, in Hong Kong to use process writing, right? You, you ask them to draft and redraft. So we'll skip this one. Last one. And I'm coming back to what I said at the beginning. Never say never. There are few, if any, rules that should always be observed in the classroom. Good teaching depends on knowing what principles and practical strategies are likely to enhance learning. So in general, in principle, I will tend to do this rather than that. I will observe pen pennies or tips or some of them um, because on the whole they tend to be positive and lead to good results. But I also know when to abandon them. That's it. <laughs> I haven't got no more bonuses. <laughs>